And it was so funny. I was talking to like my yoga teacher today after class and she's like, oh, are you sad to be back? And I was like, no. (laughs) (laughs) And she's like, oh, and I'm like, see, she's Sicilian. And I'm like, and every time she comes back, she's like, oh, God damn it. I'm like, I'm not from Sicily. (laughs) How dare you? How dare you? I'm from like, uh, you know, it's it's fine. It's just that like, um, so for example, Last time I was home, and certainly when I lived there, like, fentanyl didn't exist. And I'll tell you what, in the Puget Sound area, that's wild. That's just, yeah, and that's just how it is everywhere, yeah, unfortunately. Yeah, and I just, um, I'm not used to it, and it hurts my little heart. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, I had to be restrained by my parents because I was, like, trying to call an ambulance for someone, and they were like, honey, no, you can't do that. They're, they, because they're like in the first place that person's just passed out on fentanyl a in mm-hmm. the second place ambulances cost money <laughs> this person doesn't have any you know mm-hmm. see it's like this is there's nothing that you can do and i was like <laughs> you know it was just pathetic. yeah like i can't i can't hack it anymore i'm too soft now i'm too soft for these streets is it so i think we all are i think mm-hmm. like you know it's just one of those things that uh like every day you come across something new, it's just a new horror. And mm. it's just like, you know, mm. how long are you going to deal with it? You know, because it's mm. like. Um, yeah, it's real. Like you, you see it, you see it every day. Like, you know, people here are struggling. Everything's getting harder. Mm-hmm. You see it like every day, like all of these like. uh like you know maimed children in in gaza and uh and all that stuff you know and it's just like i think i mean it's i know it's just becoming too much Mm. for a lot of people there's Mm. like you can't you have to be a special kind of hollowed out yeah and a special kind of like narcissist to look at like the suffering around you and be like well you know whatever it's it's fine you know yeah. like it, it's it's not you know it's not it's not gonna kill you know me you know to to see like uh homeless people and people struggling mm. and and everything and you know and to be like well you know uh that's that's their fault like it takes a special yeah. like kind of callousness to do that and you know, it's, uh, you know, unfortunate that, uh, that it, that it's like this, but it's just, yeah, I, people, yeah, it like, I don't, I mean, I don't know when anything will happen, but like it, like it just keeps seeming like, you know, the reality and, and social, um, the social fabric are just being like shredded and shredded mm-hmm. and shredded and shredded and and like like you know people people most people in America like the vast majority of people in America um have never experienced anything like this now of course mm. the homeless people in America have you know people who have been brutalized by the prisons by the yeah. racist prison system and all that sort of stuff of course they have but like for the vast majority of Americans they have not so like this like seeing it at being confronted by it every day and everything it you know it, it it starts to you know fire things up and you're like you know this this yeah. is insane like this is awful like yeah. you know like i don't i don't know anybody anymore who like really believes in like the american dream or anything mm. like that like like I, I mean i think that has been just fully like torn out of yeah. Anyone who's currently under like I don't know 45 or so, mm. like mm. that's just not a thing and like that used to be like an animating premise that kept like people in line, but you know, like now it's you're just staring at working until you die kind of. And yeah. it's like, well, what are we what are we doing? What are we going to do? Yeah. Ugh, I feel it. Um yeah, it, it was interesting to me, especially like in San Francisco, like the contradictions were just so heightened. Um, cause like I was in San Francisco proper and quite literally the hotel I was staying in, if you came out and went one way, it was like streets of homeless encampments 
And if you came mm-hmm. out and went the other way, it was like office buildings. And, you know, you see those stupid fucking driverless cars driving around for no reason. And mm-hmm. the last day I was there, like my little medieval history conference got replaced with this giant J.P. Morgan conference. I said medieval. It was just mm-hmm. a history conference. But it was like, Mm. so it went from like nerds being in my hotel to like JP Morgan people. And the JP Morgan people were in like every hotel, every theater. My friend and I tried to go get a coffee like um, Monday morning. And it was like, oh, this whole cafe has been rented out for JP Morgan. Like you can't come in the cafe. And then it's just Mm. like unhoused people who are like clearly in the middle of uh, psychotic episodes and like yelling. And I'm just like. Really? Really? Yeah. You know, just, okay. You wouldn't you wouldn't be willing to just pay, like, a little bit of tax to offset this, is it? It's just like, ugh, I hate they it. Don't, yeah, but, I mean, like, the thing about that is they don't even need to pay a tax. They just, like, yep. that money just needs to be reallocated away from the police. Like, yeah, it, I mean, like, real it's, talk, yeah. yeah. It, like, the thing with San Francisco to me, because, like, I went there... What, they, what year is it? Fuck, it's 2024 now. Mm. I went there in August of 2022. Mm-hmm. And first of all, like, walked around everywhere, did, like, was not uh, worried, was not scared for myself no, at no, all. No, no. I didn't see, I, I didn't see crime at all. Like, yeah. not even in, like, the, like, kind of like petty crime you might see like you know somebody like Mm-mm. sneaks like a uh, a candy bar into their pocket or something at a convenience store but like i didn't see anything like that like i just saw tons of police mm-hmm. and like a f- like a few homeless people but they were mostly just like harassed away by like mm-hmm. police and it's just like it's a shame because the bay area is one of the most beautiful places so beautiful on this planet oh and my it has- god probably the best weather of any place on the entire continent mm-hmm. like it, like the weather there is just gorgeous mm-hmm. it's like mm-hmm. it tops out at like 80 like no humidity just oh it's fantastic but like the people there like the 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 people who have power and who own most of the property there holy shit the worst people like mm, mm. hitler particles off the fucking charts yeah. it's just well it insane. made me understand the cyber truck right when i was there because <laughs> so this is a stupid thing to say because i was like oh the cyber trucks are for people who in their heart of hearts know that like the society that we're in and that we're creating is like kind of their fault and yeah. they don't want to do anything to fix it, but they want to feel insulated from it. Yeah. You know? And so when, I, when I'm always like bulletproof car, like what the fuck are you talking about? Like all the, like these things, like what, who is this for? And it's like, Oh, people who imagine that like quite rightly, <laughs> like someone should yeah. attack them. <laughs> right. Like, but like, but no one I is. Mean, like, but nobody is. Yeah. But, like, no. No one. Yeah. No one is attacking them. No one's going to because like that or like not right now anyway. But like, it, like the thing about it is, is like even if they did, even if they did attack, like that thing's not stopping shit. Like, oh. it, like, it, like it, it's it's just not. It's not shot. It's not stopping. You know bullets like mm. you know they like pierce one of the doors with like an arrow like you know it's like yeah it's like it, it's a, it's it's not it it's it's a it's a cure for an imagined ailment but like it's but it's a place it's a placebo cure for an imagined ailment mm. because of the imaginary things that these people are being attacked at all times, which they aren't. They should be. They should be. But they aren't. But uh, but then it's like um, the like you know they just have this cure for like um, you know oh well uh, I'm I'm being attacked. No, you're not. And even if you were, this thing's not going to stop anything. This like, is like they're being attacked by their co- conscience. Like people have <laughs> yeah. People have like shootouts and put holes in like cop cars. Like in a lot of and those do have like bulletproof re- reinforced features. Like your stupid uh, brush metal truck that looks like a. Uh, like somewhere in salvage 10 mm. uh is like is not going to stop it. It, it it's yeah it, insane just the, there there are so many 
uh, people who are destitute there that like, even if they like just banded up into small groups, they could tip over every cyber truck that <laughs> they ever saw and like wait and, you know, like just wait you out. Like, I support not, it. <laughs> I support it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, insane. I mean, like, anyway, we got to We got to We got to get all those people out of San Francisco and just like make it a place where like normal people can live in like the best uh, like. You know, bring back the, the most beatniks. beautiful, best weather. Yeah, like just anything. Like just get this shit out of here, man. I don't like, want to uh, see anything yeah. except for gays, beatniks, uh, and you know, uh, fishermen. fishermen, fishermen. Oh, and bring uh, fisher, yeah, and recent mongers, Asian immigrants who want to make <laughs> yeah. me the best food I've had in years. Oh my god, I had Burmese food. Mm. Ugh, thank God, thank God. So, you know, a lot of great <laughs> things about the bay. Yeah. Uh, and uh, oh, we should just be able to scoop around the rot and take it out. That's all. Yeah, yeah pretty much. Yeah. All right. Let's do you it. Ready to do this. Yeah, I'm ready. Right. I can work. All right. All right. Three, two, one. Hello, and welcome back to We're Not So Different, a podcast about how we've always been idiots. My name is Luke Waters, and I'm an amateurish historian. And as always, I'm joined by Dr. Eleanor Yaniga, who is anything but. Hey, welcome back. Uh, today, we're talking about nationalism in my Middle Ages. <laughs> it's more likely than you think. Um, yeah, yeah. But, uh, but before we get there... Uh, we got a couple questions uh, from our patrons. The first one is from Dog Spotter, who says, um, Mr. Luke Esquire, which, lol, uh, and Dr. Yaniga, what cured meats were they working with in the medieval period? Did the sandwich predate Lord Sandwich? What sandwich ingredients could I find? Was there a standard in the way I could uh, go get an Italian and have it be 80 to 90% the same anywhere? Did Italians have a hilar hilarious local pronunciation of any sandwich ingredients like gabagool? <laughs> uh, you know, stuff like that that no one would understand. Uh, yeah. Okay, so uh, well, I will take this in order. So in the first place, sandwich is not so much except that sort of everything was a sandwich. Because when you eat your meal on bread te trenchers, technically everything's an open face sandwich, mm -hmm. right? Just like a hot dog is an open face sandwich. Yes, exactly. Yes. yes. So it's like pretty much every meal is a sandwich unless you were eating mm -hmm. it out of a bowl. So like unless you've got a stew or something of some kind, you're having a sandwich. Congratulations. Like that's that's what's up. Mm -hmm. That's what's going down. Um, now, as to the like the uh the kind of like silly pronunciations of things i mean almost certainly because for example mm -hmm. like there isn't even like a mutually intelligible italian at mm -hmm. the time you know like regional dialects 100 mm percent -hmm. vary so they would be saying weird things about all kinds of things now um in terms of like what we would see in terms of making cured meats you got your mm -hmm. generalized curing things and these are what we do know a lot about them so like in the first place you get a lot of dried things um mm. so for example uh like fish a lot of dried fish a lot of dried beef uh drying venison this is a thing so mm -hmm. th that usually means that you cut the meat into really thin strips and you kind of like salt it um mm -hmm. And like, so if, if this is, if you're in a colder region, you've got to do that during the summer. In a hotter region, you can kind of do it wherever. Drying things mm -hmm. really, really big. Salting more generally, huge big deal. Um, and <laughs> salting is really great because it preserves your meat, but it also draws off bacteria. Uh, not that they would mm. know that, but it's, it's safe to do it. Um, and also uh, it prevents flies from coming mm -hmm. from it so you know basically that's like you put a bunch of meat into a bunch of salt and that's how you get like bacon for example there's a lot of bacon going down in the medieval period uh, smoking mm. that's another one 
uh, for mm -hmm. both uh, fish and meat. It's a big thing that they did with eels because they ate so much eel. Um, you know, and that you, so basically you usually, uh, put a kind of salt solution on it, like over a fire and then that gives it a nice mm -hmm. flavor. So yeah. Uh, pickling big two. Uh, mm -hmm. so like, uh, basically salt brining things. So you get a lot of brined meats and certainly, uh, mm -hmm. brined, uh, fishes. Um, and then confit is a big thing. And so confit more particularly in this case means like, you get a real fatty bit of meat. So usually if poultry like geese or sometimes mm -hmm. pork, it's really big with pork. And what you do then is you salt it and you just cook it for a really long time. It's its own fat. And mm -hmm. then you seal that with all the fat on it um, and you keep it in a cold place and that will last for months and months and months. Um so sealing in the juices yeah we've always done it folks and so yeah like potted pork things like that uh, are mm -hmm. big at the time um we don't really have a way we don't have like great ways of knowing like if there are all kinds of like very specifically things like you know regional things obviously everybody would have their own regional thing if you're making things like sausages and like um, salamis and things like that everybody's got their own different way of doing that everyone's got their own spices that they're throwing in the mix um, but you know these regional variations a lot of the time um, you know they're kind of assumed so they're not always written about so you can find out more by looking in cookery books but the answer is yeah they all got all kind of crazy shit that we don't even know about and they probably have more cured meats than we do because mm -hmm. their reaction to meat is to cure it because it's a world without <laughs> refrigeration. So it's yeah. like, they got stuff that, you know, we're always talking about how, you know, Four Loco could kill an entire medieval village. Mm -hmm. But probably we aren't ready for their cured meat. We're not ready for how cured their meat yeah, is. We're like, not ready for their their jerky is so advanced. And yet, yes. they didn't teriyaki a single thing. That's true. Not a single thing. That's so true. Yep. It's so true. Oh man, uh, born too early to teriyaki, <laughs> born too late to I don't, you know, I don't, some, know, I don't know whatever. F fill in the blank there. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, we would be driven well, mad also. by just one slice of medieval yeah. salami. So be, be, be driven mad by jerky that's so tender, so good, and yet lacks um, any of our advanced jerky flavors, like. Uh, Bar Texas barbecue <laughs> Texas yeah like I don't know I love it's, I love jerky but yeah I bet that stuff would be uh would be great it's you know, like the like, eldritch it, salami you're being yes yeah, 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 like yeah your mind can't even comprehend it you, know, so. you got a good piece of meat you smoke it right like Woo. it's gonna be good yeah, like that'll that, be fire. Like, you yeah, know yeah you smoke a you smoke a sausage you smoke uh you know I love smoke sausage. Smoke some fucking uh, brisket or you mm. know whatever the hell you're mm. whatever the hell you're cutting up and killing. I don't know. It's gonna it's gonna make it taste better. I bet. Yeah. Uh, Dog spotter. Thank you so much for uh, the interesting question. And now I'm going to ask this question um, with a hazmat suit on uh, because Eleanor <laughs> is uh, is gonna go uh, gonna go off. A uh, question from Paul. If y'all get a chance, I'd be very curious to know how age affects scholarship. Okay. So this isn't where this is mm. about to take a turn. I didn't expect. I thought this was going to be something about how, uh, you know, as time goes on, you know, like, do we how do we reevaluate scholarship? But no, Paul continues, because I hear people complain about old white men's scholarship. And on one hand, those old white men know a lot more uh, about what they're saying than most of their critics. But on the other it does seem like even the best educated people cling to their own knowledge, even as it falls out of date. Also, not every old interpretation is wrong because it's old. Eleanor, what about um, yeah? So old well, white welcome to the show. We're, white we're, men, we're only, white men can't scholarship. Yeah, we're all, um, we're only talking about this today, so like, that's just uh, <laughs> uh, whatever. Yeah, I, I mean, I just, like I just, yeah, I, it's fine. I got so okay. A lot of the time when this critique is being made, it's not being made because an old white guy is on the fucking cutting edge of the discipline and mm -hmm. re-updating what he does all mm. the time, right? Um, and this is kind of like one of the critiques about uh, tenure more generally, uh, which I can see, which is that mm -hmm. like once you've got a job for life, it's like, hey, congrats, and you don't have to 
constantly be reevaluating mm. and and doing things. And I mean, I don't want to be a, a real wig over here, but you know, in general, a thing that I believe about work and something that I hope is true about mine. Um, is that your work should be being updated all the time. Like I read things that I've written a couple years ago and I'm like, ah, fuck. You know, like there are, there are new things that I think about that and there's new things that I would want to apply. And the mm. trouble is when sometimes, not always, but sometimes with some of our uh, older scholars, they can become very stuck in their ways. Um, if they're a proponent mm. of one particularized school, um, then they can kind of like refuse to move beyond that. And, you know, it, it can be a problem with whole disciplines, you know. So like the, the problem that we have we have in medieval studies is that oftentimes uh, people who are safe don't want to be told new things or don't want to learn new things. Like I had real trouble uh, because people weren't interested uh, in hearing about Czech stuff. And it's not because mm -hmm. they don't, they're not aware that, check things aren't really important and relevant in a medieval sense but basically what i would come up against over and over again is that um academics would feel as though you were saying they were stupid because they don't speak czech <laughs> and the yeah. way to confront this is to just like just don't i don't see it you know and uh mm -hmm. and it, which i always said was incredibly silly in the first place because like all the sources are in latin you could do the work right now if you want to do it, like it's not, it's, mm -hmm. it's not special, but you know, a lot of the secondary literature is in check. Yeah. So you like in order to discuss it, you'd have to do that. And it feels a lot of the time like an affront. And the thing that you have to understand about academics is they have basically no differentiation between the work and themselves. Mm hmm. So if you say, oh, this method could be updated or like we're bringing these new things in the mix and we need to think about it, they will act like you threatened to shoot and kill them you know, <laughs> because they're <laughs> like, how dare you? Like my work is me and, that, and that's like my head that you're pointing a gun at if you say, have you read this? Um, so that's one of those issues. Now, um, I do think that Paul has a point though because I think that sometimes the identity, like it's neoliberal identity politics, isn't it? To specifically mm -hmm. say, oh, old white men. And it's like, well, there's not necessarily anything wrong with being an old white guy if you're doing the work. Uh, like mm -hmm. if you are 100% like out there with a really interesting, um, you know, structural analysis, um, if you're keeping up to date with all the kind of latest stuff, then it's like, yeah, go off, homie. Usually it should be that old white men is kind of uh, a shorthand for saying conservative scholarship that's been outdated. And this individual is, you know, complaining about the, uh, like, mm -hmm. you know, how the kids today are too easily triggered and, you know, they want to fuck their students, <laughs> like, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. the big thing that they come up against all the time in academia <laughs> with the older men who want to fuck their students. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just, it's, there's a lot of that. So, but I do think that people have to be really careful um, because it's true. You know, there's a lot of great scholarship uh, that is older, which holds up very, very well, or, you know, could and should be reinterpreted because there would be no work for the rest of us if everyone got it right all the time. So it's wonderful that we're always changing and growing. And, you know, it's, this is true of any field, like it should be moving forward. So I think that the epithet as a general rule of thumb is one that's being applied by people who refuse to grow and refuse mm -hmm. to engage with scholarship um, or indeed who willfully and arbitrary like willfully and dig their heels in and won't and refuse to say that something could have been wrong and things could be done better right mm -hmm. so it, it it tends it should mean people who are being kind of uh, ignorant. And this is why I don't like terms like this and I don't use uh, them myself because, uh, you know, this is not like what the Combahee River Collective had in mind when they wanted to, you know, like discuss systemic oppression, right? Like that's, that's not what we mean. And it's usually thrown away by people with a real kind of like neoliberal sense of like what things are. And it's like, um, if you want to uh change things it's not like about you know getting a young minority in if they keep doing exactly the same thing right um, yeah so uh yeah we gotta tear the whole system down my comrades are my comrades irregardless 
um, and it should be a mm-hmm. critique of uh, scholarship. Uh, but sometimes it isn't because people uh, are incredibly basic, and that's that's that. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, all I'll say is that, uh, you know, one thing that, uh, you know, I, I can speak to is that, I mean, there are probably, there are, there are a lot, a whole lot of people who are far more knowledgeable about any, basically any subject I ever talk about in the world. And I'm fine with that. It does, like, it does not hurt my pride or anything like that. It is what it is. And I mean, I think I've talked, I've talked about it or I talked about it early on in the show, but like the last history course I ever took, I got a D in, in college. Um, that's cause I wasn't taking it seriously and I was goofing off. So my freshman year, you know, whatever, mm-hmm. but, um, uh, you know, uh, it, that, that is what it is. But like, you don't have to be uh, tenured in a subject or have even studied Mm. it in a huge, great depth to be able to poke holes in certain ideas and things like that. Like, Mm. like, you know, of all the history podcasters in the world, like just based on pure historical knowledge, I probably like am in the very lower percentiles because I don't know that much you know, about everything. And I certainly don't know as much specifically, but like, I can also look at stuff and see when people are using, you know, Mm -hmm. like great man theory, or they are ignoring, um, you know, things that are, uh, not helpful to their case and, Mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And, uh, no amount of school that you've gone to is going to stop the fact that like, if you say, you know, the sky is green, like, other people who d- don't have any knowledge of you know how the atmosphere works or why the sky is actually blue can come by and go no i can look at it the sky's blue you mm-hmm. know like it like mm-hmm. you shouldn't be afraid to call people out like when they do stuff like that just because you don't have like an intense uh background in the subject because like yeah you you don't you you might not have intense background on the subject but just because someone is doesn't mean that their take on it isn't affected by a their own material circumstances or the way that they were raised their ideology Mm -hmm. their prejudices etc 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 and it's like you call that out you could be like look you know i don't know everything about about the history of you know medieval europe or the history of of the levant or anything like that but i you know I can tell you that, uh, you know, this is colonialism and, mm-hmm. and you know, this, like you, you don't you don't have to know that specifically. Like and now people will like try to belittle you for that fact. And, you know, you have to take that into account. Be like, yeah, I don't you're right. I, I don't have a specific degree. But, you know, but do I need a specific degree to be like, you know, this guy's leaving out X, Y and Z mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. info because it's not helpful to his cause? Like, not yep. really. You don't yeah. need a degree to the, you know, just like how there are some football coaches who are never any good at football, maybe didn't play at all, but they're really good at coaching. Mm-hmm. You don't have to have, uh, you know, studied all that in depth to be like, hey, uh, person who is a conservative person whose scholarship is not keeping with the times or mm-hmm. is, you know, mm-hmm. blatantly lying in propaganda to, to call them out. Like, yeah. and nor, nor should you like, because that you know like a a person you know can look and feel with their own senses and say the propaganda is wrong this Mm -hmm. is a lie it's happening every day with people in america and all across the world when their governments are saying look at this just war that israel is doing and the people are like Mm. no that's not happening at all and no amount of propaganda is swaying them and you know you don't have to have a degree in uh, you know, Middle Eastern studies, uh, middle, <laughs> middle Eastern studies or, you know, Hebrew or, or anything like that to to make that analysis. It's actually pretty straightforward just based on what you can see, you know. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, that's that right. Be, you know, that'd be my thing on it. Yeah. You know? And I, I think that you, yeah. you've also touched on a point here, which is important, um, which is, uh, you know, in history, a lot of times people, especially when they're not historians, think that history is just about like memorizing every name and date. And that doesn't really have anything to do with it. It's an analytical mm-hmm. field. Right. Yeah. And it's about like knowing enough um, about like the central things, you know, and in, in the varying actors that are involved in the world and being able to read the documents and analyze them. And um, a lot of the time, if what we're talking about is like 
old white men historians, it'll be because it was like, Charlemagne was crowned on Christmas mm. Day 800 and on January the 3rd, 801, this. And then it's like, you know, it's it's it also sometimes, if it is being leveled in a way that is useful as a term, it mm. usually means like that approach, which is like nothing. Yeah. Like that's just a timeline. It's not history. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah, I think, uh, man, hopefully, hopefully we're going to get rid of, uh, the older generation soon. Cause man, they're going to kill us all. If we don't, sure are. Uh, yeah. they just, uh, got to get them out of power. They can, you know, w- damn, they can retire. I would be, they can retire. I'd retire be retiring to a nice, if I could. Yeah. Christ. Retire oh. somewhere where we don't have to see you or hear from you, uh, anymore. Yeah. That'd be great. Uh, yeah. So, um, uh, you know, thank you for the question, uh, Paul. If you are a person who would like to ask us questions like this uh, that we will answer on the show, then please do subscribe. Patreon.com slash WNSDpod. Uh, we will uh, have a bonus episode next week and then uh, also continue our series, our TV club series on Andor uh, later in the month. Mm. But yeah, we uh, check that out. Bonus episodes, ad free versions of all this, etc., etc. You'll enjoy it. Yeah. Um, so on to the main show. So uh, nationalism is on the rise again. Or at least its loudest adherents are gaining more and more power with every passing day. As uh, the mounting contradictions of late capitalism crash headlong into the existential threat of climate change, wiping out all humanity and the material lives of people the world over get worse, our governments, which are completely neutered from responding even if they wanted to after decades of being hollowed out from within uh, by decades of of neoliberalism, thrash about for answers. Now, we, of course, know the actual solution to this problem. The people of the world unite to form a communist order based on internationalism that renders all human beings equal, both in theory and in practice. However, we don't live in a collectivized world order that views all human life as equal in dignity, respect, and circumstance. We have the desiccated husk of capitalism crawling along as it clings desperately to fleeting signs of life. Further, since we know that capital will never relinquish power to the people willingly and that the current crisis is the failure of the internationalist form of capitalism that arose after World War II, we now see both capital and our prevailing neoliberal political order are running headlong back into the arms of nationalism. In case you don't remember, uh, humanity and the trajectory of history have already seen the utter failure of this inward-looking nationalist form of capitalism. That's how we ended up with two world wars in the span of 31 years and the Great Depression. Nationalism, it's not good, folks. Uh, Though I guess we should make a distinction between the Western chauvinistic nationalism that prizes internal national sovereignty above what's best for the rest of the for the people and the rest of the world uh, that we're discussing today and the form of nationalism that arises inherently when a people that have been colonized from without rebel against their metropole and throw off the shackles of colonialism. That's a different thing altogether and is not the type of nationalism uh, we're talking about in this episode. With all that being said, you're probably asking, but Luke, why does any of that matter to me, the humble medieval history podcast listener? After all, I know that while the roots of, politi- of the political idea of nationalism began to grow during the Middle Ages, nationalism as we understand it in the modern day wasn't really a thing back then. So what has nationalism to do with medieval history? While we do appreciate uh, that all of our listeners have such detailed and grammatically correct <laughs> questions while listening to the show, we regret to inform you that history is a straight line, meaning we're both constrained by and aided by every single event and decision that has come before us, which unfortunately means that 19th century historiography and academic scholarship that read nationalism and nationalistic ideas back into the Middle Ages informs both the history we consume and the nationalism we see rising once again today. That is, unfortunately, why we've spilled yucky nationalism all over the bucolic (laughs) splendor of our medieval history podcast. Also, Eleanor just got back from a conference and did a panel talking about this sort of thing, and we're going to be talking about it uh, a bit during the coming weeks. So, Eleanor, um, before we get to uh, these 19th century charlatans twisting our beloved medieval history to their own devices, uh, let's set out a baseline. Uh, What is your definition for nationalism as we understand it in the modern day? See, this one I've kind of been going back and forth about because... um 
there is a lot, you know, you've already kind of hit on one of the contradictions, which is like, you know, the, the idea of nationalism or a nation existing kind of just can be about like language, right? So, I mean, I suppose in general, nationalism, right, as in the way that I mean it to kind of be bad is like, rooted in an identification with your theoretical own nation mm -hmm. and your and your support of its interests with the exclusion or detriment of interests of other nations right mm -hmm. so basically identifying yourself as a part of a group and saying this is what we are and everyone else fucking sucks and we therefore have a right to do whatever right like um because there could also just be like nationalism, for example, if we're talking about like, oh, I don't know, Catalan separatism or Scottish mm -hmm. separatism, which is like the advocacy of your the independence of your group from another more overwhelming hegemony that's kind of like mm -hmm. uh, encased it. Right. So basically saying that, like the detriment of other people is necessary for this. And that is very much. Um, how nationalism usually plays out, to be mm -hmm. honest. Um, so, yeah, yeah, like, um, yeah. I want this for my people and nobody else. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, uh, and now what is, uh, what is the role of racism yeah. in nationalism? Is that a bedrock principle or is it just something that kind of gets attached? I would kind of argue that a lot of the time it is. Yeah. Because nationalism in the way that we kind of see it now. So in the first place, you know, because if nationalism is about advocating for your nation group as opposed to other people, um, racism gets thrown in there a lot. And in particularly what we're going to be talking about a lot today is kind of like the 19th century strains of nationalism. And a lot of them are very directly informed by the sort of early racist ideas, right? When race science mm. is really a thing and they're making these arguments, these ridiculous arguments based on kind of like Darwinian theory, um, which mm. is like, oh, you know, like the fit groups, quote unquote, survive and they create things. So there mm. is a lot of real desire to kind of prove that certain groups have a racial affinity and there's like a racialized element to this. So... Um, which is a bit weird if like what you're talking about is kind of like a linguistic group or, you know, mm -hmm. or if you're, you acknowledge the fact that immigration has always existed and people kind of like move around and, you know, weird grab yeah. bag and, you know, and have sex with each other. And so, you know, none of that really makes any sense, but racism is inherently a part of nationalism a lot of the time because of the way we think. So, you know, we mm -hmm. really kind of believe that there's a kind of scientific, air quotes, um, mm -hmm. you, you know, definition for why groups of people come together. And, then you know, that's part of our culture more broadly. You know, um, as post-enlightenment, we like to make scientific arguments because we think that that mm -hmm. has more rigor um, than mm -hmm. they otherwise would. And so it's very, very difficult to extricate the two at this point in time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Um, so though we've gone over this uh, before, it's, you know, it's kind of always uh, nice to reinforce the fundamentals every now and again. So with all that in mind, was there nationalism in the Middle Ages? And if there was, why do we often say that it's not really the same as the nationalism we have today? So I think there was, though they wouldn't be able to call it that. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and I talk about this all the time, being a, a peruser of Czech things, uh, because, for example, mm. Czechs don't like Germans. All right. They don't like yep. them. They don't like you being around here in this place. Um, and, uh, you know, part of that, again, has to do with the like wanting things for themselves as opposed to others. And now you can you can make an argument here because, you know, of the centuries upon centuries of rule that the Germans have had over, <laughs> over the Czechs that like, yeah, I can see why you'd be mad about that. Um, but that it's something that is interesting within the uh, Czech way of looking at things because, so for example, the word in Czech for nation is the same uh, as the word uh, at, at the time. It's also mm. the same thing for the word as, as language. 
So uh, mm-hmm. it's it's sort of like very difficult for us to be like, well, what does this mean? And and it tends to come down and break down along kind of linguistic borders. Yeah, I don't know, like the food, kind of the same, you know, like mm-hmm. the the ways of being fairly similar, but there you have this very specific linguistic definition. But that mm-hmm. linguistic definition is often um, one that kind of proves who is who, and indeed a lot of the time. Um, it would mean that if you were a German speaker of some kind, you had more power and more money, right? Mm -hmm. So you have this kind of like a breakdown of nationalism there. Um, You also can kind of see it um, at times where you have particularized groups who have been forced into war against each other Mm -hmm. a lot. So, you know, a big differentiation, for example, between Englishness and Frenchness, even though they're like the ideas of Englishness and and Frenchness are, are relatively new. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, But if it's like the kind of vaguely foreign guys in your backyard stealing your cabbages, Mm -hmm. you know, then you can go ahead and and, uh, extrapolate from there. Um, But it doesn't exist in the same way because we simply don't have nation states in the same way, because it's like, well, I don't know. England owns half of France. Right. And the the English royalty are French (laughs) and they're they're all speaking French right now. So it does. It doesn't have the same easy breakdown that we would see now um Mm -hmm. and that a lot of the time is a specific kind of uh thing that happened in the modern period so kind of 18th century 19th century these ideas about what constitutes a nation or what makes up a nation state are born at that time and they have you know they infect us still to this day it's kind of how we see Mm -hmm. things right yeah yeah um so since racism is uh, so often bound up in nationalism, does does this mean that, you know, since nationalism didn't really exist in the Middle Ages, did racism not exist? Uh, does this mean that racism also wasn't really a thing in the Middle Ages? So the thing is, it's articulated differently. Mm-hmm. Right. And so, for example, you know, we talked about this, uh, the plague in London study last week that saw that, you know, black women were more likely to mm-hmm. die of plague. And the black women are more likely to die of plague because they were enslaved, right? Right. And their blackness is one of the things that allows them to be enslaved, even though they wouldn't be able to, like, articulate, you know, Africans as a group of people. Uh, Mm -hmm. They were still like, well, these are enslaved people, and what you going to do? You know, and the way that enslavement was justified in the uh, late medieval period was that it was seen as okay to do if people were a different religion to you Mm -hmm. because it was like, well, you're Christianizing them. And so like have at it because that's sort of fine. Um, You know, so certainly that plays a role. Now, if we look at enslavement in the earlier medieval period, it's an interesting one because it's like, there's tons of enslavement. Like that's what, people are just doing all the time in the early Mm -hmm. medieval period like that's what vikings do right they show up somewhere Mm -hmm. they steal a bunch of people they move them to other places right and again that enslavement is seen as okay because it's like well you picked up a bunch of irish people and you're dropping them off in france now or you know Mm -hmm. you've taken a bunch of russians and you're going to move them over to iceland so their otherness is kind of like the justification there Mm -hmm. um so there, there's a generalized kind of understanding of like others, like a, a xenophobia thing and an understanding that these people are from far away, so it's okay. Now, mm-hmm. closer ideas about racism, often you can see them more when we're talking about anti-Semitism in the medieval mm-hmm. period. Because it's really common, for example, for medieval people to write about uh, Jewish people, the, the, the concept of quote unquote Jewish blood. So this Mm -hmm. idea that there's something like at a blood level that marks Jewish people out as different to Christians. Mm -hmm. Um, And this, for example, is like one of the big arguments like against intermarriage, um, even if people convert, um, and also is a big part of why um, even converts are watched really closely. Mm -hmm. Because there's this idea that like their blood itself is polluted by Jewishness, and you will see them talk about that. Um, Mm -hmm. so yeah, and this kind of like also spills over to the fact, you know, I'm sure our listeners have already picked up on it. Um, a lot of this has to do with religion, Mm -hmm. you know, for people, um, which is to say that like, uh, 
Muslims or Jewish people or, you know, God forbid, pagans, quote unquote, um, they <laughs> that like that. It, there's this fear about that, like non-Christians mm -hmm. uh, being a real problem. And a lot of the time their non-Christianness is kind of like what instills a fear of them or an idea of them as different because it's like they haven't even accepted like the basic premise of the truth of our Lord, right? So there might be something kind of wrong with them. And, you know, there's also been a lot kind of done on uh, the monstrous races. You know, we talked about them a bit, uh, especially in our episode about maps. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, there's this really interesting thing, you know, about like that, how, oh, there's the dog headed people and there's like the skiapods with the giant feet. And, you know, mm -hmm. there are Blemier who have their face in their chest and they're always on the, in these places that Europeans perceive to be as peripheral right mm -hmm. and this idea that over there there's these scary monsters right who are races you know and then that, that's what they call it. like I mean the dog headed people are still people and there's a lot of back mm -hmm. and forth about whether or not they have souls and all this stuff and then as <laughs> Europeans spend more and more time in those places like those monstrous races get pushed further and further out it's like oh turns out mm -hmm. they're not in Russia I don't know they must be in Mongolia you know, because mm -hmm. I don't know what's going on. And so they kind of move out and out and out. So there is always this understanding that kind of like not within Europe, there can be scary races of people who are mm -hmm. like not quite human. So that's always there as well. And that really informs a lot of the way that people relate to foreigners and it informs xenophobia. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like. Uh, you, you even had xenophobia for like people who were from like other towns, oh God, yeah. you know, like, they, oh, yeah. like, you know, that you, we, we've talked about a bunch of times about how, you know, like people who came in from other towns or whatever were sometimes watched very, very closely mm -hmm. and, uh, mm -hmm. people were often quite superstitious of them. So yeah, you got that. I mean, like what happens when someone comes from another country or, you know, yep. something else and yeah, it's, you know, mm. Mm. It, it's it's one of those things where um you know uh, europe wasn't 100 percent completely white or anything at the time but like you know they uh, you, there were you know there were people of color in europe at the time but like uh you know they were still uh wary of like the guy from york who came to you know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Glasgow, you know, wherever the fuck they're, you know, and they're just like, oh, I don't know about that guy. He's from that place. You know, yeah. You know, so, yeah. I mean, like, yeah, they just, you know, people, people are, I think, uh, inherently they do have good, but uh, also mistrustful of people who aren't exactly like them. And, you know, that, uh, that's where you get some of this, unfortunately. So, yeah, um, that is... Uh, nationalism racism and uh the middle ages but you know we're here to talk about and you did you gave a uh, panel talk on the conference mm -hmm. um about this so like 19th century historiography academic history things of that nature how did they use both medieval history and myths about the time period to reinforce growing nationalistic ideas modern nationalistic ideas i should say yeah, like I so I've got a really great quote from a wonderful art, article about um, the Victorian obsession with medieval period from uh, the scholar Robin Fleming, uh, which mm. uh, is this. He says, so by the time that Henry Adams, who is a famous medieval scholar, sat down with his students in the 1870s to write America's first academic history of the Middle Ages. Gothic and Romantic-esque revival churches and their town halls were coming to dominate urban centers across the country and many houses, including Adams' own. And they were being crammed with often Gothic-expired kerosene lamps and castled teapots and dangerously crenellated baby cribs. Oh, I would geez. argue that from the medieval t history was from the time that medieval history was first examined in America in the mid 19th century until the 1890s and the founding of the American Historical Review. This world of medievalizing architecture and Gothic household goods exhibited exactly the same sensibilities as the medieval history written by Americans. This picturesque history shared with the more general Victorian culture of medievalism a love of the romantic, 
a notion that the external trappings of the medieval represented deep and profound virtues, a fascination with false origins and half understood science, and a habit of collecting historical details and then passing them together to form a grand anachronistic whole. Right. So this preach, is, get their asses, et cetera, et cetera. hundred percent. Like, unfortunately, I like the houses, but whatever. Right. So yeah. it's a really kind of particularly interesting thing. Because we've spoken before at length about how in the 19th century, there's a real longing for an imagined medieval time. Mm -hmm. And this is an, a general rule of thumb. It is a reaction to industrialization. And also it's a reaction more generally to enclosure and the fact that so many people have been like completely disenfranchised and, and, and driven out. But part of what they are doing here is they're specifically longing for the medieval period because they see it as inherently virtuous mm -hmm. and very specifically Christian, right? Yes. And so wanting to go back to the medieval period for answers to things is a way of kind of aggrandizing religion in a very straightforward way. Right. Saying that a society that was more religious in character is morally preferable to the one that we have here. Now, part and mm -hmm. parcel with that and along with ideas of nationalism is, you know, an imagined past that is just white people. Which mm -hmm. we know is not what European history actually is or, or what society was like in the medieval period. But it is also like a reaction to coming into contact more frequently with non-white people um, and mm -hmm. kind of desiring um, an imagined past where they are not there. Um, you also see rather a lot of desiring for um, a kind of military domination of other people in this way that kind of like the Middle Ages throws up for them. So um, they like these romantic ideas about knights uh, fighting just wars in order to impose religious ideas you know you can see where i'm coming mm -hmm. from this you know mm -hmm. when you're involved mm -hmm. in the wholesale slaughter of non-christians um you know then you're often looking for people to go to that now it's yeah. also seen as a way of justifying nationalism because when you have a varying number of smaller kingdoms that are often but not always linked to linguistic groups this is seen as kind of benefiting ideas of nationalism, right? So it's like, if we compare and contrast, for example, with the Roman period, which they also romanticize, but in a different way, like Romanness, because it's an empire, it's like a Latin shell on top of a lot of other different things that are happening within mm -hmm. it, right? Whereas there's this false idea that it's like, oh, well, Scotland is just a bunch of Scottish people and England's a bunch of English people, whatever the fuck that means. And France is a bunch mm -hmm. of French people. I mean, there's 18 million different ways to be French. No, it isn't. Uh, you know, and uh, <laughs> Bohemia is full of Czech people and, you know, blah, 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 blah. And, uh, you know, so oftentimes when people are writing about nationalism or thinking about nationalism at this time, they go to medieval history as a way of proving their differentness. And now sometimes mm -hmm. that can be uh, kind of innocuous, for example, like in the case of, I don't know, Czech people, right? So in the 19th century, there's a big movement called uh, the Narodny Obrożeni in, uh, mm -hmm. in Czech, which means the, the like national revival, Narodny. Uh, Obrożeni is mm -hmm. like revival, Narodny is a nation. Um, and... This is kind of like a way of where they go back to medieval history all the fucking time and they say, oh, look, see, we are distinct from our current Austro-Hungarian overlords, right? And they're making a specific call for independence from the Austro-Hungarian Empire. They want Czechoslovakia to exist. They are advocating for Czechoslovakia at this time. Um, and so they say, oh, look, look at Jan Hus. Uh, the, mm -hmm. the, you know, he was killed by the Holy Roman Empire, this shows that Czechs are always at odds with German speakers and we are a distinct nation, right? That's one way mm -hmm. of doing it. Um, Germans, meanwhile, are using it to advocate for the idea of Germany, mm -hmm. which didn't fucking exist, right? But they're like, I don't know. It's like, because everyone was like, I don't know. I just got thought we were all speaking German. And they're like, no, yeah, no, but brah, we're the same though. Brah, brah, <laughs> brah. Look, look at our like, you know, entangled interests and like, surely this is, this is like a nation, right? And the English, meanwhile, are doing the same thing in England to be like, we are the special, we're God's special little lads. And that's why we're allowed to take over India or whatever. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, so everyone can kind of do with nationalism what they will. And medieval history allows you to kind of do that if you have bad faith. 
uh, because mm-hmm. since things are happening on like smaller regional levels and you have these carved out areas, it allows you to say, see, everyone is different and that's like inherent, right? Mm-hmm. And not a product of how information exchange works at mm-hmm. the time, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's a, yeah. And then it, and then it makes you okay. Or, you know, it, it helps to make you okay with the fact that like, you know, they're being enslaved or you're enforcing some backward system on them or you're, I don't know, eradicating 90% of the population of two continents mm-hmm. in like 180 years, you know, mm-hmm. it, it makes it okay because you could be like, well, I mean, sure that happened, but you know, we were Christianizing it and they were sub you know, human mongrel, you know, and you're just, and, and there you go. And there you have justification, you know? Yeah. So everybody loves, uh, you know, the science that, that we came up with in the, in the 19th century. It's just, you know, fantastic. (laughs) And then, okay. So this spills out in all kinds of areas of society, right? Like that we see in the 19th century. So for example, you know, when you and I would use the term Victorian, we're like, Oh, it's a Victorian house. That's neo-Gothic. Right. If it's a Victorian Mm -hmm. church, like what what you're actually talking about is either romantic or neo-Gothic. Right. And there is a reason why this particular vernacular of architecture kind of takes over in the 19th century. And so um, Henry Ward Beecher, who is like an architect and artist, wrote in 1859 this. And he says, a house is the shape which a man's thoughts take when he imagines how he should live. Its interior is a measure of his social and domestic nature and its exterior of his aesthetic and artistic nature. It interprets in material form his ideas of home, of friendship, and of comfort, right? So Mm -hmm. what he's kind of saying here while he's advocating for these kind of like grand medieval-esque homes is that like when you make medievalism ideas about architecture, it's not like just a fashion, but it is about your values, Mm-hmm. And you're like saying, oh, I have these correct values. And the correct values are those that are kind of like linked to the medieval period, right? So mm-hmm. um, like this then has all kinds of like knock on gross nationalistic ideas, right? Because so there's a book um, written in 1817 called The Styles of Architecture in England from the Conquest to the Reformation. Um, mm-hmm. And they believe that this guy, this particular uh, historian, James Hall, um, said that, oh, you know, like, the pointed uh, arches that you see in Gothic architecture, those were started by like the pre-Norman English settlers who made wicker, uh, wicker the, the windows. And that proves <laughs> that like, you know, there's something very special and quote unquote Anglo-Saxon about mm. these. Right. Um, so they, this is ridiculous, right? Because like those were invented in the 12th century. They were invented in France. Uh, But they're Mm -hmm. also doing this weird thing because what they're saying is that like picking these things shows that you are religious and hey, who's religious? Like who is the dominating class in 19th century America? Protestant people, right? So Mm -hmm. they're seeking two things. They want to have like a nationalist idea about like what the Mm -hmm. architecture is. So they're like Anglo-Saxon question mark because that's how they see themselves as like this mythical Mm -hmm. race. Um, And then also they want to say, and by the way, Catholics had nothing to do with it. It definitely wasn't the French church inventing this in the 12th century. That's not what happened, right? So basically what they're saying here is that Gothic stuff is like a specifically authentic Teutonic style. Mm Mm-hmm. And, like, German Christians invented this, right? Um, <laughs> yeah. And, you, you know, it ha- so it has a very specific meaning when you look at this stuff. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, so, like, ba- basically what happens here is that, like, Gothic art is being used to say there is such a thing as Anglo-Saxons and you are one. And Protestant consumers in America are like the real descendants of these great European nations, right? Mm. And you are, you can be separated from all of like the unpleasant Catholicism with that, right? So all the (laughs) medievalisms you kind of get in America in the 19th century really um, feed into that. You can say. And and so like architecture, I think, is a really great way of talking about it because I think all Americans have seen some cool 
Victorian houses. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And it also explains why, you know, there's like the American Gothic style mm -hmm. uh, is uh, probably biggest and had its longest uh, yeah. legacy in uh, the American South where, you know, those ideas got adopted, you know, Protestantism bad or I'm mm -hmm. sorry, Catholicism bad, you know, yeah, uh, yeah. you know, the, the white Anglos did, you know, did this good thing for us. Yeah. Um, the only other thing I'll say is that uh, Henry Ward Beecher was a real one. He sent guns to abolitionists in Kansas. They were called Beecher's Bibles during the Civil War Fuck yeah. or, I'm sorry, before the Civil War. Uh, yeah. Henry Ward Beecher. Shout uh, out. Cool guy. Thanks for the uh, I'm sure the people of Kansas were thankful for the guns you sent them so they could uh, kill the. The slavers who came. Yeah. Um, it's incredibly cool so to yeah, kill slavers. That's a good point. It is. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, how, how, that, but it unfortunately doesn't have anything to do with uh, this right here. So, um, you know, you talked about architecture, but how does this creep into like the history itself? Because mm -hmm. as, as our question earlier from Paul said, you know, a, a lot of our older history is being replaced by stuff, but mm -hmm. at the same time, some of our older history is still very good, still very useful. Mm -hmm. And some, of, and it's still good to use it to know where you came from in a lot of ways. But so like, how are we still processing the, uh, yeah. 19th yeah. century ideals. Yeah, yeah. So it's really interesting because um, one of the papers that I attended this week was kind of talking about this and it was talking about the um, formulation of the medieval Academy of America, which I think was actually mm -hmm. founded in the 1920s. Right. But, mm -hmm. When it was founded, very interestingly, everyone, like the all of its founding documents are very grand and they're like, well, everyone knows why it's important to study medieval history. And I was like, what? Take me back. Like. We must return, <laughs> right? <laughs> like, okay, and like you, I and, and you and you return. You get in your time machine. You're like, yes, yes. it's going to be so exciting. And you get out, and they're like, no. you know, who built all this white Pro or, or English Protestants. You're like, no, no, why, why? God. <laughs> the and, monkeys, Paul curls, yeah, yeah. And that's the thing is, one of the things they said in the foundational like writings about it is they say it is evident why the creation of a medieval history society is necessary and it's like is it and i'm like they don't mean like me uh because medieval yeah. history fucking whips <laughs> and like and it's very good and about <laughs> peasants no that's not what they mean right um like uh mm. so what they mean is that oh yeah because you can trace your very pure protestant ancestors to mm -hmm. you know the settling of britain or whatever right um, mm -hmm. And interestingly, when the Medieval Academy of America is founded, so is the uh, journal Speculum. Speculum means mirror. And it mm -hmm. remains the biggest medieval history journal that there is, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so these two things are kind of inextricably linked, right? Like, the, the, you know, the, if you want to make yourself a, a name for yourself as a medievalist now, you get published in Speculum. And that's, oh, mm. that's interesting because that's like the American nationalist one, right? Like that's the one that's like <laughs> trying to be like, oh, yeah, no, it's cool. Like you're you're a knight, but for America. Do you want to go to California and run some Mexicans out of there? You know, like it, this is what it, it's doing, right? Mm -hmm. So we also see that kind of reflected in the history. You know, like again, in the Czech idiom, as I was saying before, like one of the big things I have to wave through is like 19th century historians going, oh, Czechs are special little guys and we're all really cool. And it's like, so if you want to read anything, you have to kind of get through that. And then there's like really gross examples. So for example, um, a lot of the printed materials that you'll find that have like, uh, you know, printed Latin sources, right? So uh, mm -hmm. there's a really famous one that you end up using all the time if you are a uh, someone working on the Holy Roman Empire empire which we just shortened to call mgh or the monumenta germania historia um, and it's basically like here's the important medieval german documents like these are like all things that pertain to mm -hmm. the german lands and they're very important bra it was straight up run by nazis for a really long time <laughs> like yeah. just here's some nazis being like here you go here's the here's the texts that are important right and the trouble mm -hmm. is you use them like, i use them all the time right because like mm. they're they're there and it's like you know you do not under any circumstances got to hand it to nazis but there's a reason why they are saying here is a bunch of works that you should read here are things that are meaningful mm. about germanness and like uh 
they they exist like for most nations at the time like this is a big project that people were involved in like the czechs have their own uh which is fonte serrerum mm -hmm. bohemicarum uh and like uh you know that i use all the time and then i mean you'll have kind of relatively benign uh ones where it's like mm -hmm. there's this guy jean paul mean uh who is, works in like the french idiom and he just did a lot of it for the church more generally and there's like huge compilations mm -hmm. of church documents but these things that we're still using are produced in a very particularized context. And if you're lazy, which a lot of us are, you mm -hmm. know, because we don't we don't have time, like not all of us have like the money or the time to like go to the archives wherever we are. These are the things that you're going to be using time in and time out. And that is expressly shaped by nationalist historians in the 19th century who are like, this is what you need to know. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's the work there. Right. Yeah. Then, yeah. you know, we kind of get to literature as well, right? And we talked mm. about this a bit in our series on Arthuriana. But, like, brah, remember when everyone was like, hey, let's redo King Arthur, except this time no one was fucking. And, like, yeah. and everyone would count, would like, can't I just pet, bet that uh, all the members of the round table were having a good time? Kind of a thing, right? <laughs> um, and so uh, this guy, W. Lucas Collins, wrote um, this article, King Arthur and His Roundtable, for Blackwood's Edinburgh Magazine, right? And check out mm -hmm. this little piece of Victoriana. Arturum expectare, which is like, you know, the return of Arthur or the expectation of Arthur returning, is mm -hmm. no longer a taunting proverb. Arthur is come in prophecy and popular tradition. After all, spoke truly. Once more is the hero king's uh, the hero king rings through the length and breadth of England. Years ago, the laureate caught his first glimpse of him in poetic trance. The British king is more ubiquitous in his resurrection than ever in the days of yore. So, you know, <laughs> how King Arthur is going to come back and save England. Well, he kind of came back to save literature and everyone started writing their own little Arthur stories. And part of this is why we also have this outsized idea of how England is important in the medieval period, which it mm. is not, right? Because, like, everyone starts writing <laughs> new myths about England and about uh, Arthur. Mm -hmm. And it's really seen as, like, literature of the time is dominated by this. And this is what everyone was talking about. And it's, again making a nationalistic call out right so like mm. what if you are serious about uh literature or writing things you're gonna write beautiful things you're gonna write beautiful things mm -hmm. about motherfucking king arthur right and mm. all of that creates this this tension where there's this imagined middle ages that is expressly linked to uh, ideas about nationalism ideas about power and ideas about religiosity that are stripped from their initial context in order to kind of mm -hmm. assuage the feelings of the people who are involved and to also justify their mm -hmm. position in the world. So, you know, in the 19th century is a time of immense brutalization, um, especially of uh, non-white peoples. And all of these stories are used to kind of like say, and that's why it's okay that British people run India, right? Mm -hmm. Because don't you like King mm -hmm. Arthur? Huh? Huh? Yep. And we still have to wade yeah. through these things as historians. We still have to encounter these things. And these are the medievalisms that most people know. The medieval history mm -hmm. that most people, the average man on the street runs into is, you know, he likes a house with towers on it. Dude, don't we all? Like, mm -hmm. I feel that. Um, you know, knows a little bit about King Arthur. Uh, you know, knows a little bit about the Crusades, right? And all of these little bits that they're picking up that are just kind of like, in our popular imagination have directly come out of 19th century ideals um, and they are about placing the world order in a very particularized way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, uh, that's the, um, the residual effects yeah. are what we feel of it. We are, you know, looking at it and, you know, a lot of, a lot of those misconceptions have been, um, uh, done away yeah. with. They're, we're in the process of doing away with them and, and stuff like that. But I mean, they still, you know, they still permeate. Yeah. You, you still see these, you know, accounts, these uh, people online, you know, or like, you know, uh, you know, return to this like um, 
splendorous wonderland that is mm -hmm. uh, the Middle Ages mm -hmm. when, you know, men were men and women were women and black people were on a continent, you know, by themselves and we didn't have to deal with any of yep. that. Yeah, you know, yeah. you, you see like you see that uh, idea and people are like, oh, you know, like obviously that's how it happened, mm -hmm. you know, and it's mm -hmm. like, uh, you know, most people, I think if you like you know just sit them down and talk to them they probably would be like well you know it wasn't exactly like that but at the same time like there are enough people who still believe this or who still see it as a platonic ideal that you know mm -hmm. they're just gonna drag us all down with them oh completely <laughs> so like a personal example i don't know what possessed me but i, I read a comment which I should never do. Uh, below, like, uh, the TV show I made about medieval, like, working women's lives in the medieval period. And mm -hmm. I essentially framed that TV show with a big quote from this uh, particular uh, thing, A Letter on Virginity, which is basically, you know, it's a political pamphlet where they're like, ladies don't get married, it's fucked, right? Um, and so, like, of course, it's a polemic, and of course they're going really hard on the, like, you know, your life will suck and don't, you know, you might die in childbirth or whatever. Um, but one of the big things they talk about is how exploited wives are within marriage and like how much work you have to do, like both um, in terms of taking care of children and regular work. And this man, his comment was, I don't like the framing of this because it's too modern and women then didn't see themselves as being exploited. That's us. Put and I'm like, I lit literally, <laughs> literally, <laughs> This is a document from the medieval period telling you that women felt exploited and that there were groups of women urging the liberation of other women because of the inherent exploitation within marriage. And I gave you a fucking document that said that. And some guy is like, no, I don't think it was like that. Right? Cause well, because it... Because it, it the the worldview of people like that uh is that you know the uh, back then things were better because not only were you know living in your own plot of land and you had your animals and everything like that uh and you never saw any minorities or anything or any anyone with blue icky blue hair mm -hmm, that causes mm -hmm. you to die for some reason because dyeing your hair is apparently the worst thing that anybody over 60s ever seen but like um <laughs> but it also like it also teaches that like uh you know women like their place yeah. in society yeah. you know like they liked it they uh, you know that woman she of course she didn't say she she didn't feel the sting mm -hmm. and the the gross condescension of exploitation because you know the bible told her to do this her husband told her to do this and she did it because she was yeah. happy and if you just go back to that that's what will happen to your wife too and it's like yeah okay yeah. man so it's like we're doing this all the time cool. right and you know part yeah. of the reason that this happens is like you know we we don't get taught medieval history it's like despite the medieval academy of america mm -hmm. existing you know you only get taught medieval history at a university level if you seek it out right you could live mm -hmm. your entire life ignorant about it and that you know whatever um and part of what we are taught it'll be like if we're taught anything at all it'll be like oh 1066 and then magna carta and magna carta has a completely distorted which we ran it about before like magna carta is as an important mm -hmm. document is pretty much a 17th century <laughs> invention uh mm -hmm. it's not real sorry 18th century invention it's not real it wasn't mm -hmm. important right and then they'll be like and moving <laughs> on right and so we get taught yeah. these little myths so the only things that we really run into to tell us any different are, you know, the houses on the street and, you know, mm -hmm. the sword in the stone and all these little yeah. things. So we get to have these really romanticized ideas that were put forward by people who fundamentally mm -hmm. wanted you to have real nationalistic Protestant ideas about mm -hmm. what the medieval period is. You know, every time we got to like argue about the Holy Roman Empire with people and like and the idea that it's stupid, it's because of ideas of nationalism. Right. It's like, oh, the real way to mm -hmm. organize a society is by national group, right? Not like whatever. You know, like all of these things are, 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 are I mean, I was just like, how is the Holy Roman Empire organized? No, it's like, not by however. Uh, quasi, uh, quasi feudal uh, city state. Conglomeration. Religious. 
I don't know, homie. Uh, fam- familial relations across, uh, and also there's seven electors. I mean, you know, we, 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 we get, you know, you know what? We'll like, no one has yeah. no one has room for the wacky anymore. What about wackiness no. as an organizing principle? No. Like, come on, bring no. it back. I, like all, yeah, yeah. These borders are too hard. We need them to be now. Oh like, yeah, if you want people. to do nationalism in the medieval period, I'm down for it. Like, like bring back the Holy Roman Empire. Let's fucking go. You know, like I. I'm going to need the people of Alsace to uh, switch which nation they're in uh, 37 times over the span of like 88 years. Like, I, I need that to happen. There and, is like and a... then just, oh, we're French. Now we're German. Now we're, uh, oh, uh, uh, how do we end up in Belgium? What the fuck? What? what? There's what the 100% fuck are we in Alsatian like um, independence movement. Oh yeah, like yeah. oh yeah. yeah, God bless them. Yeah, I love their wine. I love those people. Alsatians got some of the best food going, <laughs> and like in my opinion, the best wine good. in the world. So you know, good for them. Yeah. go go back, uh, go back to to independence. I don't like. Oh man, like <laughs> I love, I love, um, I love European independence movements um, because like. Some of them make sense. Mm-hmm. Scotland makes sense. Mm-hmm. Ireland makes sense. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the like, uh, you know, the Spanish ones, for the most part, they make sense. But then you'll have, like, no, we want Alsace to be its own thing. It's like, okay, like, I, I get where you're saying, and, like, you guys got switched up a bunch, and, like, they traded you guys, mm. like, ten different times. But, like, you're not your own, like, thing. Alsace isn't that big and you're like, just kind of you know, like so a little like bit of that just, and a little bit of that you know yeah like i mean like if you if you want to like uh you know if you want to be independent then by all means you know but like i just um huh you know you know uh, yeah like the catalans they you know they have like a whole region and yep. you know, the basques and and you know <laughs> and and you're just like alsace and it's like I don't know, 15 square miles somewhere between France and Germany. And everyone's just like, yeah, I guess, man, whatever you are now. <laughs> I love it, bro. I love it. Strasbourg has a new let's capital. Bring it back. Let's bring Yeah, you know. Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. And while we're at it, we can, you know, and for old time's sake, just to piss off the Germans, we'll demilitarize the Ruhr again. Yeah. I don't know if they're, or we'll deindustrialize it. I don't know if they're, you know, I don't know what the hell is in the Ruhr nowadays, but, you know, yeah, we'll do that. That was a big thing. Back hell yeah, back. absolutely. Why not? Yeah. Um, you know, I think that's uh, all the uh, time we have uh, for this thoroughly uh, depressing topic today. Uh, but yeah, we're gonna um, we're gonna revisit this. We're gonna have some uh, some mm-hmm. interviews and some more stuff in the future. Yep. Uh, talking to some people who about um, Christian nationalism, uh, yeah. about Christian nationalism and white nationalism, and you know mm-hmm. uh, how how it started in the Middle Ages and what they did and how they used it and everything like that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that uh, that's gonna do it uh, for today. But uh, Eleanor, before we go, uh, what what do you have going on? I believe you have a book coming out in I do. Um, in, in paper. Yeah, um, other than having a lot of jet lag going on right now, uh, yeah, the Once in Future Sex just about out on paperback. I think next week in the United States, nice. if I am not mistaken, um, and in the rest of the English speaking world in February. So if you haven't bought it yet. This is your sign, you know, help a girl out, <laughs> help. Uh, so yeah, help. <laughs> go check that shit out. Um, as usual, I'm on the socials at going medieval. My blog that I haven't written anything on since last month currently is going hyphen medieval.com. And you know, by the time I get my head in the game and I stop uh, being confused about what time it is, I shall have made you guys something else soon, but not this week, not this week. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah, well, uh, you can find me, uh, Luke is Amazing, on stuff. And uh, you can find my old show, People's History of the Old Republic, if you want to hear me yak about Star Woo. Wars. But, uh, but yeah, that's going to do it for us today. Uh, thank you so much for listening. We'll see you next Bye. time. Bye.